Uh, okay, thank you. Um, the two keywords of my title are uh, bandwidth and homodyne, so I'll be talking about, uh, this is a shortened title uh, from what uh, is written in the pamphlet. Um, I'll be talking about broadband homodyne detection. Uh, now, the work I'll be presenting has been done as part of the optics group of Avi Peer and in collaboration with the group of Michael Rosenblum, also from Bar Ilan University. I don't think this works. Okay. Uh, any quantum measurement requires a selective amplifying mechanism uh, in order to amplify the quantum information of the specific physical quantity that we want to measure from the quantum regime into the classical regime where we can tamper with the signal and obtain the information without affecting the specific uh, physical state of the system. Uh, so there are two, uh, basically there are two uh, measurements we perform in quantum optics. The first is photon number counting, um, <coughs> where the amplifying mechanism uh, in photon counting is some kind of an electron avalanche, for instance, in a photon multiplier. Now, <coughs> the second measurement is the homodyne measurement, measuring the quadratures of the light. This is a fundamental measurement because the quadratures are uh, the fundamental variables uh, that act as the optical analog as position and momentum. Uh, so here are the quadratures, and the amplifying mechanism in the homodyne detection is the multiplication of the weak quantum signal with a strong local oscillator, strong classical local oscillator. Okay, now it turns out that the standard technique for homodyne detection is bandwidth limited. So we can only measure a field like this with slow variations over millions of optical cycles, but uh, with a bandwidth, with an electrical bandwidth of maybe megahertz to gigahertz range. But it can come nowhere close to measuring a field like this, where both phase and amplitude vary at rates that compare to the single optical cycle itself. Now this is even, even though we can easily generate an optical signal with such an optical bandwidth. For instance, the spectrum you see here is the output spectrum of spontaneous parametric down conversion. The main tool that we use in order to generate squeezed light, spending 100 terahertz, almost an optical octave in frequency. Now, it is this bandwidth limitation that I want to address in the talk. Uh, just to give you an idea why we would like such a broadband measurement, two examples, one, quantum computing. Uh, I believe Olivier is here. Uh, he doesn't need my introduction, but I understand we'll be talking about this topic tomorrow. Uh, a, one of the uh, nice, a nice uh, demonstration of large cluster states uh, entangle an entire frequency cone. Uh, it turns out one of the main difficulties of this scheme is not the generation of the cluster state, but rather its measurement. Uh, since the homodyne uh, measurement that we uh, apply can only measure a single frequency mode at a time. Uh, and in quantum communication, where we would like to increase the rate at which we can process uh, quantum information, uh, of course, the natural path uh, to take is by uh, ex exploring the frequency or time domain, uh, such as frequency or time division multiplexing, where we divide the detection time, a single detection time of the detector, into many, many time bins, uh, adding an additional time stamp onto the single photon that we detect. However, uh, Although we would like to use simultaneously all the time bins, we can only detect a single photon per detection time. So instead of gaining n bits of information, we are left with only log n. So to the outline of my talk, I will start uh, by an introduction to what exactly are the quadratures and their homodyne uh, measurement concept. Uh, then I will discuss the expansion, going from a single mode to two mode and broadband, and the uh, standard solution for measuring two mode quadratures. Uh, and then I will present our uh, broadband homodyne method, which is based on optical parametric amplification, uh, an experiment to demonstrate this method, and a 55 terahertz result uh, of homodyne measurement, uh, 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 which is quite nice. Uh, and then I want to take a step back and offer a broader view uh, of the homodyne detection. 
So there are two uh, main methods that we use in order to represent the field oscillation. The first use an uses an amplitude and phase, and the second uses a superposition of two pure quadrature oscillations, a cosine wave and sine wave oscillation, where the information is encoded in the quadrature amplitudes x and y, which can be time dependent. Now, on the quadrature map, in the rotating waveframe of the optical carrier frequency, a classical coherent oscillation would be represented by a point. However, the two quadratures obey a quantum uncertainty principle so that we cannot obtain complete information regarding both quadratures simultaneously, so we should uh, replace the point with a circle of uncertainty. So in a semi-classical coherent state, the uh, two uncertainties, delta x, uh, uh, are identical, delta x equals delta y. However, we can squeeze the uncertainty, reducing the uncertainty of one quadrature at the expense of increasing the uncertainty of the other. Now, this is true also for the vacuum state, where the, <coughs> where the amplitude, the average amplitude is zero, and the oscillation phase uh, is completely undefined. And now, so how do we measure uh, the quadratures of the oscillation? Well, it is similar to the calculation of the coefficients of a Fourier series. We have our uh, field oscillation with time-dependent quadrature amplitudes, and we multiply it by a strong, coherent, classical local oscillator with a well-defined amplitude and phase. And then we integrate or average the product. So if we tune the phase of the local oscillator to a cosine wave oscillation, we obtain the x amplitude, the, the x quadrature amplitude. And if we tune the phase of the local oscillator to a sine wave, we measure the y quadrature amplitude. Experimentally, if it would work like this, we have our input signal, optical signal that we want to measure. We have a strong local oscillator. And uh, we need some kind of a, a mechanism to control the phase of the local oscillator and an optical mixer. And the only problem is that pure opti optical mixers do not really exist. So instead, the standard technique for homodyne detection uses the electrical nonlinearity of photodetectors. This one? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so again, we have our input signal that we want to measure. We have the strong local oscillator. We use a beam splitter in, in order to produce superpositions of the two fields, local oscillator plus signal, local oscillator minus signal. And then when detected on the photodetectors, uh, the photodetectors generate an electrical signal that is proportional to the square of the input optical, uh, of the optical input. Uh, when subtracting the two electrical signals from the two photodetectors, we are left with a homodyne product. So where is the bandwidth limitation of the standard homodyne detection? It is, of course, in the photodetectors, which are limited to electro electronic bandwidths, megahertz to gigahertz range. For a low noise, quant a low noise quantum measurement, uh, this is only a few hundred megahertz. OK. And now to a mathematical slide to <coughs> clearly define what exactly are the quadratures that we want to measure. Uh, I express here the field oscillation using uh, the complex amplitude, A. And it, uh, you can quickly show that the two quadratures are simply the real and imaginary parts of the complex amplitude. Uh, as so, the frequency components of the quadrature are the symmetrical and anti-symmetrical parts of the complex amplitude spectrum. So it turns out that a single frequency component of the quadrature is actually a combination of two uh, frequency modes omega and minus omega, around the optical carrier frequency, which are usually termed the signal and idler modes. So if I now switch to using the signal and idler indexes, I can write down the uh, frequency component quadrature operators, uh, which are A signal plus A idler dagger and I signal minus A idler dagger. And you can show that they do not commute and, in the, and obey a quantum uncertainty principle, just like the position and momentum. So what does a, a single frequency component of the quadrature look like in time? Well, it's an equal superposition of two frequency modes. It's a beat. 
Now what distinguishes between the two quadratures is not the envelope of the, of, the, of the oscillation, rather it is the carrier phase. It's the phase of the, op of the optical frequency, the optical carrier. Uh, for the X quadrature, the carrier phase is always either plus, uh, either zero or pi. And for the Y quadrature, the carrier phase is always either plus or minus pi over two. That's what distinguishes between the two quadratures, not the envelope. Now, the thing is that the frequency of the beat envelope can easily be of optical frequency, making it impossible to detect using photodetectors, just too fast. So how can we measure uh, the quadratures of such two-mode, uh, 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 sorry, uh, before I continue. Uh, but however, there is a standard solution to measuring the two-mode quadratures. This uses two separate homodyne setups, one measuring the signal and another measuring the idler mode. However, each setup needs its own local oscillator, matching local oscillator, one for the signal, one for the idler. And the problem with this is that if you want to measure a broadband signal, uh, you would need a dense set of local oscillators matching each uh, individual frequency mode of the spectrum. Uh, another problem is, as for the two-mode quadratures, it would be impossible to obtain the complete two-mode quadrature information. Uh, and I will explain this later on. So how can we measure a broad, the, a, how can we apply a broadband quadrature measurement? Well, we would like to replace the narrowband electrical nonlinearity with a broadband optical nonlinearity, an optical parametric amplifier. Now, an a parametric amplifier is special because it does not amplify every signal, every input signal. It only amplifies the signal if it is of the right quadrature. The other quadrature will actually be attenuated. So if we have an input, which is a combination of both quadratures, X and Y, the output of the amplifier will amplify the x while attenuating the y, the sine quadrature, in this case. And we can choose the specific quadrature we want to amplify by tuning the phase of the pump, which in this case acts as a local oscillator. So the homodyne idea is simple. Simply amplify whichever quadrature you want to measure. Now, an advantage of parametric homodyne is that I only need a single local oscillator in order to measure the entire bandwidth, all of the frequency pairs simultaneously. Okay, uh, so as I said, the output of the parametric amplifier is a combination of one quadrature that is amplified and the other uh, orthogonal quadrature that is attenuated. What happens if the gain of the amplifier is not strong enough in order to overwhelm the attenuated orthogonal quadrature? Well, even in this case, by applying a pair of two measurements, first amplifying one quadrature, then amplifying the other quadrature, I can solve for the average quadrature inten intensities. Of course, this is assuming that I know what, what the gain of the amplifier is. So I need to calibrate the parametric amplifier somehow. It turns out that this is a simple process. All you need to do is to measure the outputs of the amplifier for a given set of known inputs. For example, I can block the signal input, measuring the output for, in, for idler input only, or I can block both the signal and the idler, measuring the spontaneous output. Actually, it's the amplified vacuum input. It's the, it gives me the vacuum level. Or I can uh, measure the transmission of the signal and idler through the parametric amplifier by blocking the pump. So in order to demonstrate this method, uh, what we do is we measure, the, uh, we apply a homodyne measurement to, broadband, uh, to a broadband squeeze state uh, uh, generated via spontaneous four wave mixing. Uh, what we expect to see is one, uh, the uncertainty of one quadrature, which is reduced below the vacuum level, while the uncertainty of the other uh, uh, quadrature is increased, stretched. Uh, now, a convenience of measuring, of convenience of using a parametric homodyne is that we can generate the squeeze state and measure it using the same mechanism, the parametric amplifier. 
So the experimental setup would look like, look like this, it divided into two parts, a generation and measurement. We have a first parametric amplifier uh, generating the broadband squeeze state. And then we add a second parametric amplifier, but now acting as a homodyne measurement with its own pump so that we can control, control the gain of the, of the amplifier and the quadrature, the phase of the pump that defines the quadrature, the specific quadrature that we want to measure. And all that is left to do is to measure the output spectrum. And now here are the raw, is the raw output of the homodyne measurement. So what you see here, the maximum levels indicate the amplification of the stretched quadrature. The green dashed line is for vacuum input. When I block the signal and the idler and I measure the spontaneous output, this is the vacuum level. And indeed, you can see that the minimum levels, which indicate amplification of the squeeze quadrature, are below the vacuum level. This is the raw output, and you could directly see a 55 terahertz of squeezing in a single measurement. Now, you're probably asking yourselves what exactly are the fringes. Uh, they are due to dispersion inside of the system so that uh, different frequency modes uh, uh, see different delays and arrive at the homodyne measurement so that for some frequencies we measure the squeeze quadrature and for others we measure the stretch quadrature. But of course, we can tune the phase of the pump or the local oscillator to measure any quadrature we like and scan over the entire spectrum. After normalization of this result, uh, we can see that we measure up to 1.5 dB squeezing, 32% uh, uh, below the vacuum level over the entire 55 terahertz spectrum. Uh, obtaining a measurement like this with the standard homonite technique would be practically impossible. And now I want to take a step back. As I said before, uh, obtaining the two-mode quadrature information using the standard homonite technique would be impossible. The reason is impossible, and the reason for this is because actually uh, the two-mode quadratures are, are each two-mode quadrature is a combination of two parts, a real part and imaginary. This simply means that the envelope beat is defined not only by the envelope amplitude, but also by the envelope phase. So when we tune the phases of the two local oscillators, we need to choose whether we want to measure the real part of the envelope or the imaginary part. What we would like to do is to take the original input and divide it into two parts. So we can simultaneously measure both the real part and the imaginary part. However, this is impossible because we cannot uh, produce two copies of the original quantum, identical quanti uh, copies of the original quantum state. And now, let's take a look at the quantum measurement, the quantum optical measurement. Well, we start out with a quantum information in a quantical quantum regime with optical bandwidth. And we end up with a classical signal with electrical bandwidth. So there are two transitions in this uh, a process. The first is amplifying the information from the quantum regime to classical regime. And the second, it reduces the bandwidth from optical signal to electrical signal. What we would like is for the quantum classical transition to be as early as possible, as far left as possible, so that we do not suffer from any loss uh, or from our uh, tampering with the signal in order to obtain the information. But as for the bandwidth, that we would only like, we, we only want to lose right before the detection later on, as far right as possible. And let's take a look at the homodyne measurement. Well, in the standard homodyne detection, it is, we use the photodetectors in order to amplify the information from the quantum regime to the classical region. But it is the same photodetectors that also reduce our bandwidth from the optical input signal to the electrical output. So the two transitions occur inside the photodetectors. What about the parametric homodyne? Well, actually, we find that we open a window, a gap between these two transitions. So here is the parametric amplifier. And the parametric amplifier amplifies the information from the quantum regime to the classical regime without losing the optical bandwidth. The output is still optical. It is only later on when we actually apply whichever measurement we want, whichever detection we want, that we lose the bandwidth. 
So now, if we want, the information is now classical, so we can split it into two so that we can measure both the real part and the imaginary part of the two mode quadratures, if we like. So to conclude, a parametric homodyne offers, or parametric, using a parametric amplifier for homodyne detection offers practically unlimited bandwidth. A, a nice convenience is that we can both generate the squeezed light and measure it using the same mechanism. And we can measure all frequency modes of the quadrature using a single local oscillator. And to finish, using a parametric amplifier as a selective pre-amplification uh, 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 gives us a big advantage so that without, so we amplify the information from the quantum regime to the classical regime without losing the optical bandwidth of the information. Now a question you can ask is, why not use a regular amplifier? Why do you need the parametric amplifier? Well, if we could, that would mean if we could amplify the entire quantum state, this would mean that we could measure both quadratures simultaneously. Of course, this would, this would defy the quantum uncertainty principle. You cannot measure qu both quadratures simultaneously. So by definition, a regular amplifier adds noise to the system. But the selective parametric amplifier does not. Thank you.